I just want to say good evening to everyone. Um, my name is Michael Poyer. Um, I'm currently serving as the department chair of physics here at Ohio State. Um, and I just want to say for um, everyone from the, uh, the Department of Physics, um, I'd like to welcome you here for this, um, I, what I think is like, I mean, basically a unique event for us, um, that we're going to have a public lecture here by our uh, Nobel laureate, uh, Pierre Agostini, I mean, who is a professor of physics here at our actual Ohio State University. Um, and it's really wonderful to be here with all of you. Um, and his, his lecture is actually being broadcasted live. This actually not, you know, I, I really appreciate all of you with, with the weather warnings and everything to still come out. Um, but this is being actually broadcasted live. And so I also want to welcome people um, here that are listening uh, remotely. So here, I just want to give a, just a, a very brief introduction for Dr. Pierre Agostini. Um, he earned his PhD from the University um, Aix Marseille um, in France in 1967. He then moved to the um, Commissariat de la Energie Atomique. Did I say that right, uh, Pierre? Is that okay? That's that's actually the the CEA or the CEA. It's the uh, basically the French Atomic Energy Commission. Um, and they have um, actually multiple, um, basically, campuses throughout France, and one is in um, Paris-Saclay um, campus, and, and that's actually where he spent a significant amount of time from actually 1968 to about 2002, and did, you know, really his seminal work um, that ultimately led to the, the Nobel Prize, um, for him winning the Nobel Prize. Um, he... he I believe, actually, in 2002, he was basically, uh, he had to sort of take a mandated type retirement. This is a French sort of thing. And so he um, spent a, a couple of years at a, as a visiting professor at a few different universities, including Laval University. And then, um, amazingly, we were able to um, recruit Pierre, actually, with um, basically Lou DeMauro's leadership here to Ohio State, where he became a professor of physics. Um, he's been the re recipient of a number of honors, including the Humboldt Senior Fellowship. Um, the, he became a, a fellow of the American Optical Society and received the William F. Meggers Prize from the uh, American Optical Society. Um, and then, of course, right, in addition, Dr. Agostini was awarded the 2023 Nobel Prize in Physics with Anne Louie and Ferenc Krauss. And the, the precise uh, sentence, they say, is it's for the experimental methods that generated attosecond, and that's one billionth of a billionth of a second pulses of light for studying electron dynamics and matter. Um, and another thing I just want to just highlight is Dr. Agostini is a very strong advocate for training of young scientists. In fact, um, we had probably one of the, I think, the highlights um, here while, while Pierre here is at Ohio State, um, where um, we, he actually met with like 300 undergrads. And there was a, a, a really amazing event that was put on by the Institute for Optical Sciences. Um, and I really say that he's really a true inspiration for um, future generations of scientists. And so tonight, we are honored to listen to Dr. Agostini's um, um, uh, presentation on the topic of atos to zeptos. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Pierre Agostini. Good morning. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, a bit jet lagged or something. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, so uh, the title of my talk, at least the first part of this title, is from Ato dot dot dot, and uh, we'll see why the dot 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 uh, later. All right. So during uh, the past 50 years or so, uh, okay, we had access to shorter and shorter pulses of light. And uh, okay, uh, I could talk about microsecond or picosecond or femtosecond, but okay, don't worry, I will talk only about attosecond, at least in this part of the talk. Um, Okay, the, the story I want to tell you tonight starts uh, in the mid-80s in Saclay, 
and uh, Anne was uh, a young PhD, and she had had a, a PhD a few years before uh, on multi-photon ionization, multiple ionization, and uh, there was an old suspicion in multi-photon that maybe uh, excited states of the atom are playing a role. And so she sets up an experiment to uh, check if she could detect such excited states. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, she was expecting to see some fluorescence or some, you know, some line uh, from the uh, atoms that are excited by the laser. But what she saw was something really unexpected, and uh, uh, it was a surprise. And for a while, for maybe for a few years, we were talking about that in, in at lunch. <laughs> oh, uh, and the the thing was that the spectrum that she saw immediately, almost immediately, was something which is shown here, and. Uh, if we understand completely the low part of the spectrum, the one in yellow, in, in the yellow box there, uh, that's yeah, uh, yeah, right in the, in the multi-photon idea. That's from one order of multi-photon to the next. Uh, yeah, the, the the signal should drop by several orders of magnitude, and. Uh, for that reason, the parts in the red box, it was yeah, completely new and completely not understood at that time. Uh, so, uh, the, 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 the thing was that for a, quite a large number of orders, the signal was not decreasing at all, or basically not decreasing, right? So. Uh, that was completely against any um, multi, I mean, uh, multi photon or any perturbation theory. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was, uh, that was one of the two uh, results that she had that the spectrum was a constant in the red box and then drop off at some energy. So we did not understand anything about that. And uh, uh, it took a number of years from, let's say, from 1987 to 93 uh, to understand really that uh, part of the spectrum and also the cutoff. Uh, so this idea of Ken Coulander and Ken Schaeffer on one hand, Paul Korkup on the other hand, uh, was that, okay, you can describe what happened to the electron after it got into the continuum by imagining that it's a classical uh, particle. And this classical particle is taken by the field, accelerated, and eventually it can return to the same position, to the position where the nucleus is. And there it can yeah, do a number of things. It can, uh, it can convert its kinetic energy into photons. And that's the, the high harmonics spectrum. Or eventually take out or extract another electron and that's uh, something that we'll see in a moment. All right, and uh, the first victory of this theory was that he had a very simple and immediate explanation for the cutoff, and that's the kinetic energy, the classical kinetic energy of the electron uh, is converted into the highest possible frequency in the uh, harmonic generation. All right, so that was a, a big success of uh, 
this uh, recollision or subcycle of physics. Uh, one uh, thing that goes with uh, the, the recollision physics is that uh, for each uh, order, each uh, lines that you see in the spectrum, there are uh, two trajectories, electron trajectories, which depend on when the electron starts and when it returns. And uh, this so-called long and short trajectory, uh, because of the time is long or short, and uh, uh, have different properties. And uh, this is something that was completely understood from the beginning. Um, all right. Uh, so Han calls it another type of light, and uh, uh, it's true that if you look at the spectrum, we don't know anything else than this kind of source with a type with a spectrum of that type, uh, and uh, yeah, it's a. We know, um, yeah, the, the, the black body radiation, for instance, with a continuum spectrum, or we know lasers with a very monochromatic spectrum, but that was completely different. First, it was going into uh, the X-ray or the soft X-ray regime, and uh, all those lines separated by uh, the, the, the same amount, uh, was something that was completely different. And, okay, if you look at the spectrum, you could ask yourself, uh, by just looking in the time domain by Fourier transform, would that be uh, a source of attosecond pulses? And uh, those two guys in 92 says, yes, <laughs> uh, of course, uh, they had to assume that the phase of the harmonics agree, uh, and uh, that, uh, yeah, uh, Farkash and Todd published this uh, sort of a little bit obscure paper, but that we knew about, uh, um, that each, each pulse in the time domain is uh, equal to a uh, uh, is proportional to the inverse of the number of harmonics that you can couple. All right. Uh, the problem was before Rabbit, we didn't know the phase at all. And uh, there was this paper in 96 by and, and the co-workers, uh, and the paper was showing a calculation according to the Levenstein model uh, of the phase, okay? And this phase was, uh, looked like random, uh, not at all what we wanted to see, except in, in the cutoff region at very, uh, uh, in the uh, high energy uh, part of the spectrum, where it's constant, but unfortunately there are no photons there, basically. So, uh, the, yeah. It, and this calculation was really bad news for attosecond, because if, the, if you have n harmonics, let's say four in this calculation, in phase, then you get something like attosecond pulses. But if the phase is random, then you get ah, something random. And uh, uh, there is no hope to have attosecond pulses from that. All right, so measuring attosecond pulses. If you are afraid how to measure <laughs> billions of billions of a second, uh, Okay, don't be afraid because first, before us, people had measured femtosecond pulses and uh, uh, 
All right, so just one step at a time. All right, uh, when I started working in the 60s, uh, the lasers were nanosecond, and uh, it was enough to have a fast photodiode to see the birds and to measure that. Uh, later on, picosecond laser came, and it was a bit more difficult because picosecond is already faster than the fastest photodiode, and we had to use straight cameras to measure that. And eventually, femtosecond laser came, and for that we needed the frequency resolved optical gating uh, that Trebilo has uh, invented uh, at the time. All right. So, uh, yeah, what's the trick of a Trebilo? Uh, the frog, Trebilo's frog, for visible or uh, uh, infrared femtosecond pulses is here. Uh, and the, the important thing is that first the, the measurement is done in the spectral domain, all right? Forget about the time domain, so forget about uh, the femtosecond itself and look in the, in the spectral domain. And then you have to have some nonlinear device there somewhere. So in the first uh, Trebino's uh, frog, that was a second harmonic generation crystal. And that's very easy and very natural to use in the visible or infrared. But uh, there's no such thing for the XUV or for the X-ray, uh, the soft X-ray, that uh, the harmonics are, are not so. Um, all right, so the nonlinear device that we use instead of a nonlinear crystal that did not exist was uh, a process that was uh, discovered in the 79 in Sacre, uh, and uh, it's the fact that uh, a photoelectron can absorb a little bit more photon that necessary to be ionized. So uh, in this case, for instance, uh, the photoelectron can be uh, produced by, by uh, absorbing one omega x photon and plus a laser photon. So uh, the kinetic energy of the electron is then h bar omega x minus ip but plus or minus uh, bar omega. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, of course, we didn't know about anything about atosecond when we discovered that in Sacre. And uh, uh, that was in 1979. And when, even when before picosecond laser, so, uh, well, we didn't think about atosecond at all. Okay, uh, in 96, there was a, a theoretical calculation by those three guys from University Pierre and Marie Curie in Paris. And uh, uh, somewhere, it's a big Fizz Rev A paper. And in the corner of the Fizz Rev A, there is this calculation, which was not, again, oriented into attosecond at all. But uh, they calculated what happened if you uh, irradiate an atom with two consecutive harmonics and the laser. So because of the the difference in energy between the two harmonics, which are only uh, odd harmonics, uh, and the laser, which 
splits exactly the, the difference, then uh, there was a, a, a side bed that is an extra peak that appears in the spectrum. And this side bed, because of the quantum mechanics property, uh, is subject to quantum interference. And that means that if we, uh, if we uh, scan the delay between the laser and the, and the harmonics, then we see an oscillation, we should see an oscillation with uh, a phase. And this phase is directly uh, including the phase we are looking for, the phase of the harmonics or the phase difference between two consecutive harmonics. Plus a small correction that is here is called uh, delta phi phi atomic. All right, so we have to know is delta phi atomic one way or the other by calculation or something and uh, uh, then subtract it from the total phase to get the harmonic phase that we are looking for. All right. Um, okay, so this is the setup that we use. Uh, uh, I don't want to go into too many details, but first of all, uh, we have to have two uh, atomic beams, one to generate the harmonics and one to uh, photo ionize. And uh, 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 by the way, those are the two students that did the hard work <laughs> at the time. And so uh, the setup was imagined uh, mostly by, by uh, Arm Muller from Amsterdam. And so what is it? Um, we first start with a Gaussian beam and then there is a cache in the middle of this Gaussian beam which transform it into uh, a donut mode. Yeah. And uh, in the center of this cache there is also a hole that permits a small beam to get through. So the first, the donut mode is used to uh, generate harmonics and is blocked by the pinhole a little bit later. And so, uh, hence from uh, the previous uh, idea is that uh, the, um, there is a superposition of the small beam with uh, the harmonics and uh, those are used in, into the second laser into the second jet to uh, make the photoionization. And uh, from this simple device, uh, it was very ah, kind of small. Uh, uh, we could do the first measurement. All right, so this is a very nice picture, <laughs> movie from <laughs> my student uh, the, of the time, Pierre-Marie Paul, but unfortunately it doesn't work here. <laughs> uh, so you have to imagine that, uh, oops, 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 all right. Uh, the side bands are here and depending on, that's okay, depending on the delay between uh, uh, the laser and, uh, and the harmonics, the sideband's amplitude is uh, changing. So it's a very nice movie, but don't movie. Um, all right, anyway, so you can imagine that what we see is shown here and uh, well, the, the signal to noise is not perfect, and, but it was enough to measure the phase difference between the, the harmonics and 
the result is plotted here. So it looks pretty nice. I mean, uh, they look almost linear, and uh, that's exactly what we wanted. So uh, one of the questions that arised at the time was, uh, OK, OK, uh, then from this measurement, uh, we can reconstruct the time domain because we have the amplitude and the phase. And uh, uh, the result is what is called uh, an attosecond pulse train, where the, the cars of the train are those short pulses uh, 250 out a second in that case, and uh, yeah, uh, the the uh, between two cars there are this 1.35 femtosecond, uh, which is uh, a half of the laser period. All right. So then the question arose: What about this calculation? I mean. What was uh, wrong? I mean, was the calculation wrong, or was it our experiment was also wrong? And uh, uh, the answer was actually found in another paper of Anne Lillier back in 98, in 1998, uh, where she showed that the long and the short trajectories that you remember from the beginning had different uh, far field distribution, and the 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 long trajectories had this uh, dotted shape uh, distribution, while the short trajectories is just in the middle, and uh, in our case, this pinhole that we used we had put there to block the dotted mode beam after he had generated the harmonics was actually doing something else. It was doing something very important and it was killing essentially the long trajectories, yeah, uh, amplitude. And so uh, it was yeah, definitely one of the most important uh, piece of equipment we had although not very expensive. Okay, uh, all this ended up in, in Stockholm. And uh, so this is a picture of um, the students of the time. Uh, Harm Müller, who invented this uh, wonderful acronym that's above, explained above. And uh, yeah, so now you can use rabbit as a noun or as the verb as you want and uh, yeah and Philip Balku from the yellow way is is there also uh, okay and then almost immediately came the question what can we do with the tray I mean uh, it's it's nice to have single pearls and actually, uh, some people were working on that, like Ferenc Krauss, for instance. But uh, uh, is there something that you can do with a trade? Yes, uh, there is, uh, as long as you, what you want to measure is in between two, uh, two cars of the trade. Uh, OK, so. Uh, one such example is the photoionization delay, and I will take about, could talk about that in a second. And then uh, we can explore uh, the recollision physics, because the recollision physics is by definition in between two of those, uh, of those pulses. All right, the photoionization delay, the most important or the most interesting part in it is uh, the Wigner delay. The Wigner delay is explained vaguely here. And um, if you have one electron that goes 
by uh, a nucleus somewhere, not far from from where he is. Uh, then uh, the the wave function of the electron of the electron uh, undergoes a phase shift, and this phase shift depends on the energy of the electron. And the Wigner delay is, by definition, the differential, the derivative of the phase shift with respect to the frequency, to the energy. So, in our case, uh, it's related to the, the delta phi atomic, or so-called delta phi atomic, and the delay which corresponds to this Wigner delay is delta phi atomic divided by 2 pi because uh, 2 omega, sorry, uh, by 2 omega because uh, uh, our spectrum is such that there is nothing in between, right? So we cannot take the derivative as a function of, of omega, but we take this uh, approximate derivative. All right, photoionization, there are tens of publications, uh, including a few from our own group, and uh, I will not go into the details, but you can understand that it's very interesting because, yeah, it, it, it brings into play the atomic potential, and uh, for theory is very nice and uh, very interesting to look into uh, such uh, uh, data. Okay, uh, I show here this one uh, because, yeah, first of all, it talks about septosecond, and uh, I'm afraid to say that it's a little bit misleading. It's not really zeptosecond in the sense we are thinking of pulses of zeptosecond time, but we'll come back to that in a, in a moment. Ah, uh, then there is this story about uh, one of the first measurements uh, by Schulz, uh, by the Ferenc Cross group, uh, and uh, this measurement was uh, the difference, the delay difference between the 2s and 2p states in neon. Don't have to worry about that. But uh, the result is interesting here. They have a very nice result, which is 21 attosecond, and it's very, uh, it's clearly. Uh, exact, or as exact as the experiment allows to be. But, uh, yeah, a year after, the theory came, and the theory was uh, half <laughs> of, the, of the result of, uh, uh, of Schultz and Co. Uh, so, uh, this was a little bit, yeah, and we makes us a little bit uneasy because the theory was supposed to be very well understood and correct, and the experiment was kind of nice, so we did not understand what was going on. And this situation lasted for a number of years, until, uh, nine, until 2017, uh, when uh, Anne Villiers uh, did an experiment using the harmonic uh, the spectrum of the harmonic uh, like that, that is using uh, an atosecond pearl strain to do the measurement. And it revealed that uh, the first experiment, the experiment by, by uh, Ferenc, had a, uh, how do you say that, a fault. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, and that it was not, uh, didn't have enough resolution, spectral resolution. And uh, you can understand that because 
in the case of an atosicon and isolated atosicon pearls, uh, uh, the spectrum is very wide. And uh, uh, while in, in the case of the, uh, of the train, the spectrum is the spectrum of harmonics, and it's much, much more narrower. But uh, although we are in the overall, it's the same, but the, the, the fact that it has those zero in between the peaks allows to have a very high resolution, a much higher resolution than uh, than the one with uh, the auto, uh, isolated data second pulse. And actually, the theory, uh, worked, which is a solid line up there, works very well in this case. So uh, the question was solved and uh, this lack of spectral resolution was solved thanks to rabbit and to uh, uh, the atosecond pulse trade. So uh, that was a small victory for us. <laughs> we are, uh, yeah, we are using the atosecond pulse trade in, in the lab here. All right, so uh, another experiment was done recently uh, at OSU, and uh, the experiment consists in clocking the electron motion in the recollision physics. Okay, and this recollection, this uh, motion was uh, in principle known for a long, long time, and uh, then one could ask the question, why did it take so long? to get into, into that problem. And the question, is, the, the, the reason is that uh, the mid-infrared laser had to be developed and in, uh, during that time. And uh, the reason why it's interesting or in this is necessary to use the mid-infrared laser is that the, the maximum kinetic energy uh, of the electron when you return to uh, the nucleus is proportional to the square of the wavelength. And if you have a long wavelength laser, then you can use less intensity and still see uh, enough kinetic energy to, have, to extract a, a second electron. Uh, all right, so the experiment is simple. We have to scan the delay. Uh, the the, uh, the atosecond pulse train is scan uh, is delay scan with respect to the laser, and uh, on the other hand, we can detect uh, the doubly charged ion. On the other hand, and, uh, uh, so. That seems to work perfectly uh, with the theory, and uh, we are happy with that. Okay, so this is still not published, but hopefully it will be published. All right, so I am afraid my abstract promise something about <laughs> medical application, and uh, I am a bit uneasy. I was. Uh, learning about that in Berenst Krauss' uh, lecture in Stockholm, and I didn't know really what he was talking about, so I wrote him, and he sent me a number of of, uh, of papers, and it's really it's using the fact that uh, if you excite a molecule with a very short pulse, like a femtosecond pulse but a few cycle pulse. Uh, then uh, the excited molecules can emit coherently a field that is specific to the sample, to the molecule. And they can detect this field. And uh, in this um, method called field resolve infrared spectroscopy. And uh, if uh, we can hope with him that 
uh, with broadband infrared probes, uh, probing of uh, human cells, uh, they can detect cancer and they have proof of, of a quite um, large specimen. Uh, what specimen? Uh, a sample. A sample, uh, yeah, uh, that uh, this was probably true. And uh, so that big hope for uh, an application for uh, of uh, attosecond pulses, or at least attosecond spectra. All right, for uh, the remaining of this first part, I would like to uh, turn a little bit into the future and ask, uh, will X-ray FDR replace the harmonic generation? I mean, we are used to a tabletop <laughs> kind of, of uh, experiment uh, uh, set up and uh, uh, the FEL is something really a bit different uh, uh, by the, the size, of course, of the apparatus and also by uh, the constraint that using such a source impose, like, uh, yeah, um, program Kobinji and so on. But I would think that uh, there are at least two uh, papers in the last four years that show that probably uh, free electron laser are the, the substitute to the uh, harmonic generation. One is that uh, first uh, the, the, the power of uh, the atosecond pulses that are generated by the free electron laser are uh, orders of magnitude larger than we can do with the, the harmonics. And uh, yeah, and the harmonics, are, uh, they are very nice, but <laughs> they cannot uh, do everything. Uh, the second thing is that uh, recently uh, in 2024, uh, there was a paper showing that uh, atosecond pump, atosecond probe, was uh, had succeeded in in uh, the um, in the phantom in the atosecond pulses from uh, the X-ray laser, and that's sort of a dream that we cannot hope to. Uh, realize any other way. I mean, the harmonics are not strong enough to allow to allow these kind of things. All right. Uh, okay. So dot 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 to Zepto. Uh, this part of the talk is not my responsibility, <laughs> but it's mostly the responsibility of theorists. Um, so, uh, zeta second is a thousand times even shorter than the billionth of a billionth, and uh, uh, so that's 10 to the minus 21 second. And actually, this paper that I mentioned before, the zeta second birth time delay, is, uh, is using uh, not uh, zeptosecond pulses like uh, we would like to do, but is uh, using is measuring the the time between for the photons to go from one atom to the next to the other in uh, H two molecule, and uh, so the two forty seven zeptosecond there is certainly the smallest slice of time that was ever recorded. Although it's not the kind of measurement we would like to do with pulses that duration, but 
they did it by a completely different method and uh, uh, the, the, it's an interference method and uh, uh, that's some sort of sign that the zeta signal are not that far. Oops. Okay, um, a little bit more in the in the kind of thinking with that we have is that the recollision physics uh, is here the 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 uh, maximum intensity is is uh, well known to be three point seventeen u p and uh, uh, that's proportional to the intensity of the laser. So why not crank up the intensity and, and uh, instead of looking at harmonic uh, 40 or 50, look at harmonic, uh, <laughs> I don't know, uh, thousand times more. Uh, uh, the laser exists, but uh, is that enough to ch crank up the intensity? Well, not quite, because the recollision physics is limited by the magnetic force uh, in the beam. And this magnetic force increases with intensity. So uh, uh, the magnetic force here is drawn in, in blue, and it takes the electron out of the recollision ring, really. So uh, if we crank up the intensity, the electron will not return to the nucleus and will not yeah, uh, make harmonics or also. So uh, what can we do? Well, the reason why it's like, like that is because the nucleus is heavy. Yeah, The electron is very light and the nucleus is heavy. And so uh, how can we solve this problem? <laughs> make it leaner? Okay, uh, this is where the theorists come in. They say, oh, it's simple. Take positronium instead of an atom. And instead of, uh, uh, yeah, so if you use positronium, yeah, uh, the, the, there will still be this magnetic force that pushes the, the system in the direction of the propagation, like uh, in the other case, but this time both the electron and the positron will have symmetric or so, so symmetric trajectories, just because they have the same mass, and just one difference is uh, is uh, uh, the charge. So uh, there, there's this calculation in Sinclair there show that uh, yeah, you can have harmonics up to uh, KV yeah, instead of uh, yeah, tens of EV or, or hundreds of EV, let's say. Um, so yeah, if you can have, uh, if, you, can you, if you can buy positronium somewhere <laughs> and keep it <laughs> in your apparatus long enough to do the experiment, uh, that's, that's okay. So yeah, Christoph Keitel group has become a specialist of this kind of, uh, of proposal. He's working at uh, the Heidelberg Mike Splunk Institute. All right, and if you don't believe in zeptosecond like that, uh, okay, maybe. <laughs> uh, and uh, then uh, the same group uh, say that, okay, the octosecond. Um, I didn't go more than the title of the, this paper. So <laughs> I will stop here. Thank you very much.
Okay, wait, so we'll hold on for just one second and then, yeah, so the young person in the front was asking, what have you, what you said, what have you been doing since you've won the Nobel Prize? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a very generic state uh, question, Pierre. What do you, what do you want to use the microphone to? Or no, you have one. No, no, I have one. So what's the question? I repeat the question again. <laughs> What have you been doing since you won the Nobel Prize? Oh, that's uh, since October. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I've been uh, having dinner with the king. Of <laughs> 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 yeah, that was a big moment. I would say. Can you, can you ever the medal. That was the president's press, I think. Maybe. Phone call. <laughs> I don't know. I was a bit emotional. <laughs> All right. Hey, Professor Agostini, thank you for being here tonight. What a, what a treasure for you know physics students and a career physicists and amateurs like myself. But. Um, so gl so glad it was free and I could be here. This, this is great. Thank you. Um, so what? I guess the final question is what's where does this go from here? Um, people always ask like why do you care about um, special rel general relativity? And I say we know the answer. It's because your GPS and your phone would not work if they didn't apply special and general relativity to the solution from the satellites. Um, when Kip Thorne and Barry Barish and uh, Ryan Weiss cracked the LIGO 50-year project in 2015, opened up a whole new field of astronomy and physics, you know, multimodal, I believe they call it. So whenever they detect a LIGO, LIGOs are all over the world now. Everyone's doing them. We're going to put one in space soon. So now when, when they detect one, boom, they can tell the triangulate and tell where it came from. You know, SM42, Sagittarius, whatever. Um, and, every, and all the other spectrums, Hubble, JWST, can zoop, and they Oh, collect incredible data, right? As it streams in. So what now? Like what, what, what you've done, I, I barely understand it. Um, my name is Greg. I have Northern Mechanical Engineering in '85. Um, but so w what happens next? Like if we, if okay, kepto seconds after atto seconds, and then yocto seconds, a thousandth of a of a kepto second. What can we do with that? Like, can we see new things? Are going to open new fields of study and like. Multi, other multi, multimodal, okay, we hit it with, with these and then come out with another wavelength and, and I don't know, is there another Higgs boson God particle waiting to be discovered? Or what, what do you think? I mean, no one knows, but what could it lead to? Th thank you for, for entertaining me. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, about uh, zeptosecond or yocto or whatever. I mean, uh, yeah, we can keep going if the technique uh, exists, uh, except that there is a limit. Uh, the limit is the plug time, and we'll never go beyond that, and that's 10 minus 44. So uh, there's still a, a room for a number of Nobel Prize. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not uh, now. If you ask me what are the applications uh, of this kind of pulses, so far it has been mostly fundamental research. And uh, uh, I, except for perhaps the applications that Anne is uh, looking at now, or Ferenc Krauss. And, and this uh, medical application I was mentioning. Uh, uh, I don't think there are any, uh, but the, the future can show differently. And uh, as I try to show a number of times during this talk, uh, we, we cannot predict the future. I mean, why we do physics? Not for attoseconds. And uh, yeah, since uh, 1979 and up to now, I mean, the path that leads to atosecond is completely random. And uh, so, I don't know. Let's hope for the best. 
Hi, Pierre. Uh, my name is Nick. My question is, what do you love most about your research and your time that you've spent your entire lifetime that you've done? And what have what are some of the most memorable moments of that time? And what, what do you really care about in that? Uh, yeah. Can you repeat the question for me? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what do you love about the research and the time that you spent with your life researching? What, uh, are some of the most memorable moments and what are the times that you really, uh, care about? And what are the, some of the experiences that you really care about during that time? I don't know. Um, uh, maybe the time I met Ludi <laughs> uh, um, Yeah. Uh, there are many, uh, many uh, examples of uh, times where we were very happy with what we were seeing uh, in the experiments, but not always because yeah because the experiment was right uh, sometimes we are very happy and we were wrong to be happy so yeah i'm not sure there is a, a general answer to that uh, when i talk to uh, when i i try to bring uh, Arm Muller to Stockholm because, uh, yeah, he was certainly one of the main actors of this uh, rabbit uh, business. And he said, Oh, yeah, having dinner with the king is uh, what I drink of. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Professor, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, my question to you is, what advice would you give students and young scientists? I didn't catch it. What, what advice would you give a, a, a new student or scientist getting into the field? <laughs> uh, okay, my, my motto now is, don't worry about applications. I mean, <laughs> yeah, applications will come uh, in time if if uh, you have the experiments and if you have uh, the ideas, the right ideas. So, but just don't worry about that when you do fundamental research. Are there other, oh, there's, there's another one right there. Great. Can you just pass that? Uh, do you think that we should focus more on the experimental aspects of physics or more on the fundamentals? More on theory? Or, uh, yeah, more on the theory of the fundamental interpretation of quantum physics or... No. Well, uh, okay, the theory plays a role, of course, uh, for instance, in the, in the Wigner delay and photoionization delays. But uh, no, I think uh, the idea is uh, that the experiment will lead uh, what we have to, to say on this or that problem. Um, what do you think of theorists getting more and more imaginative with their um, ideas and predictions and from an experimentalist perspective and how has this, how has it changed over time? I'm afraid I didn't, didn't catch the question either. The question was, uh, what do you think of theorists, you know, having kind of ideas? Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, for, for a theorist uh, like uh, Christoph Keitel, uh, uh, the laser intensity is free. You can pick up whatever you need. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's... Sorry, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I would not say that this idea of the zepto-second or yukto uh, uh, 
not true or not realistic, but uh, certainly they don't care about that. Okay, they yeah, discover that you can compensate for the uh, the magnetic force by using positronium. Okay, so we use positronium. That's all. Positronium has a lifetime of. I don't know, uh, 100 nanoseconds, I think. So you have to be fast when you do the experiment. <laughs> All right, well, uh, let's, let's thank Pierre one more time for this.